Well, Aki, thanks so much for inviting me. Everybody, thanks for, um, for this really powerful stories coming up to this. Um, it's my first time speaking at a patient focused thing. Um, so this is going to be a bit of um, a bit of science, a bit of future directions. So it's kind of a mouthful of a title. And you probably don't know what a transposon is. And I'm going to get to that a little bit now and a little bit more tonight. But I think um, I'm going to mostly be talking um, not about the practical pieces that John just talked about, but about some things that in the science that give us hope and, and actually what we do. So uh, by way of disclosures, I work with a company called Rome Therapeutics pretty extensively to try to make new drugs that we hope may one day be cancer medicines. Um, but uh, none of the work that I am going to talk about today has anything to do with the company. Um, and I get grant funding from, thank you, the NIH, as well as Stand Up to Cancer um, and the Dana-Farber uh, Harvard Cancer Center. So um, Aki, I I'm here because Aki asked me to come. And she wanted me to talk about chemo resistance, which is not exactly what I do in the lab, but I'm going to tell a little bit about chemo and cancer from the perspective of a pathologist and a lot of stuff that nobody tells you uh, what, what we actually do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think about cancer, which I'm sure is very different from how a lot of people here do. So it might be helpful about why, why we can't kill it and um, what kind of things are coming down the pipeline and how I think we might be able to do better over the next you know, 5, 10, 20 years. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit now and more tonight about transposons in the dark genome, what that is and why we think it's important in cancer. So um, this is what everybody thinks I do, is seeing dead people um, as a pathologist. Sorry, my slide, something happened to the font. So we have this very like retro 1980s thing going on. Um, but um, I, I, that's actually not what I do. Um, so pathologists are key. We do behind the scenes parts of cancer care, mostly diagnostics and prognostics. And I guess actually, John, you, you really put that lid on it. I'm your sorting hat. Um, so we are trying to be, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the sorting hat works and then also about how um, we're trying to make it better, what we don't know. So we do a lot of diagnostics and prognostics. So anytime a biopsy or a resection or any of these bespoke assays or next generation sequencing assays are run, they come through us. And our job is anytime we get something to say, okay, is it cancer? And uh, there's actually sort of a joke, but it's true that it's not cancer until a pathologist somewhere calls it cancer. Uh, how bad is it? What stage is it? Did we get it all? And that's a real, um, there's a real star on that, which I'll get to in a minute. And then what therapies can we offer? Um, and, you know, I think many people here already know that major centers re-review all outside pathology. And that's because sometimes the first person didn't quite get it right. And if it's not right, it makes a huge impact. And sometimes a small change can really impact what happens next. Um, the next two pictures, the next two slides are bloody. If you don't like blood, I think probably everybody in this room has seen more than I have. But if you don't want to see that, please don't look. Um, so this is a stomach. Um, this is a prophylactic gastrectomy specimen from a 24-year-old with CDH1 mutation, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. Um, and this is what we see on, on the pathology side is the specimen comes out and the stomach you guys can see has sort of two zones. This is actually all pretty darn normal stomach with the exception of that little fold there, which no one had noticed on the previous scope, turned out to be a T3 cancer. But um, the, uh, it was actually you know, missed on some previous scopes, but this is why the prophylactic gastrectomy was done. And, and you can just see how much stomach there actually is. Um, and this is a close-up of what we actually had in the lab. That's actually just me holding it where you can really see what the cancer actually looks like when it's out. Um, and this young man was fortunate that he had the surgery when he did and that we were able to catch it here. Um, and he had really great care at Mass General thereafter and has done very well. This photo is actually from 2017. So, um, so but what happens then? So the staging, of course, informs both the prognosis and then the next steps. So what we do with a pathology specimen is we make the T stage. And basically, as you go through from the inside of the stomach out, the farther down you get through different anatomic layers, that dictates what T stage you have. And so we can call that on the slide. Now, of course, we, you don't have the end decision in staging. People like John do in the Medonc side, where radiology is combined with what we see, endoscopy, laparoscopy to put everything together. But that's how this piece works. And you know, the earlier the stage, the more localized the disease, the better our chance of cure. Um, and I think this probably audience doesn't need to see this, but of course, the earlier we find it, the better. 
And um, you know, it's really inspiring stories of a lot of people in this room and otherwise who have taken you know, these distant metastasis conditions and have, have um, shown us that, that the statistics are statistics but aren't just everybody, right? And that's really important. But um, what we need to do is figure out how to do better about finding people before you get to stage four. And then of course, treating people once you are at a late stage. So I'll just show a little bit of what actually we see so this is a representative section. Actually, this is a patient from Dr. Davis who's sitting in the back who's going to talk a little bit later. Um, this is a section of stomach on H&E. And it may look like a magic eye because that's what I thought it looked like the first time I saw it. Um, and what you're looking at here are uh, normal glands in the stomach. This is the inside of the stomach in the bottom left. And the muscle would be attached here in the top right. Um, and the normal glands kind of, the, the stem cells are down here at the bottom and they divide and go up. And the normal glands are a lot of the place, but actually this slide has cancer on it in two different places. There's some here and there's some here. And, and this is a really hard diagnosis to make because when the stomach is inflamed, the cells actually look a lot like the cancer. So for a lot of, especially early stage gastric cancer, if you put three world-class gastrointestinal pathologists together in the same room, staring at the same slide, they don't always agree on what to call it. And in fact, we do such a bad job of this that the Kappa score of moderate is considered a good job. So we are working on um, this piece of the dark genome that we think may help with some of this. So you don't need to be a pathologist to find the brown on this one. Um, so what we've found, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more later, is that this particular piece of the dark genome, this transposon, which is a thing we've been evolving with since we were single-celled organisms, it's kind of like a virus, is consistently on in cancer. And so we're trying to figure out where it's useful. So this is something that's coming down the pipe. It isn't quite there yet. I'm going to talk a little bit about how it's useful. But it's on early, and it's on in these both stage one uh, diffuse type and intestinal type in the stomach. And so we're pretty excited about this as a potential future direction. So... I think everybody here knows that the two things that kill patients are metastasis and therapy resistance. And I'm going to just talk briefly about them. I'm going to talk about why this is hard to eradicate. Basically, cancers are made up of billions of cells. It's a really big number, and it's hard to wrap your head around. And they're old and complicated. So an average colon cancer, when it um, presents, I know this is stomach, but the same rules probably apply. We just understand the colon a little bit better, is between 17 and 40 years old since the time the first bad event happened until that cancer is around. So a lot of things can happen over that long. And what is, 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 uh, comes out is heterogeneous. And you know everybody says everything is unique. But in cancer, it's really true that every cancer is not the same as any other cancer because there's a unique path that it went in a unique genetics and a unique person. And that matters. And so, of course, I've said we need to find it earlier. And the numbers of just cells and things that can happen in the cell are enormous because it's a very complicated machine. And all the levers can get pulled in a bunch of different ways. So the classic teaching is that cancer is a problem of uncontrolled growth. Now, I find this actually incredibly unhelpful. And the reason it's not helpful is because the lining of your stomach and of your entire GI tract basically divides every single day. And if your cancer divided every single day, it would double every single day. It doesn't do that. And the problem is the damn thing just won't die, right? It doesn't, it's not that it's growing too much. It just doesn't die when it's supposed to. And if we think about it that way, it's a little bit more helpful to understand what's going on. So this is from my colleague, Dan Yurick at Mass General, who works on heterogeneity at the Tremere Center there. And um, the curves are just basically trying to show how many cells are in a cancer and how far you have to get if you want to eradicate it. So even if you have a little, a little uh, cancer, a one centimeter lesion, the one centimeter lesion has about a billion cells in it. When you get out to 10 centimeters, now you have a trillion cells. And so we can, you know, we can make a diagnosis on a slide on a few hundred cells because they look funny. But if you think about just how many that is and how many you have to kill if you want to cure somebody, even if you cut out the main tumor, it's a lot. And the bigger the tumor, the harder it is, of course, and it becomes exponential. So, and then... Heterogeneity is the big problem that causes resistance because in a billion cells or a hundred billion cells, you have a lot of slight differences that end up being meaningful. So about half of gastric cancers and, and gastroesophageal cancers are essentially intrinsically resistant to the therapy that we give up front, the platinum and 
and the, FU, the five FU and everything else, if you measure at least by resist criteria, meaning like how, what happens on the scan. You guys all know this. Um, and then what's been very frustrating is that the genomics that's been done, people have sequenced everything and you know, generated terabytes of data. And the associations just aren't very powerful. All of the mutations that we know, especially in the GE cancer, they correlate a little bit with how well various therapies work. Now, of course, if you have a particular mutation, we have a targeted therapy, that's where precision medicine is coming in, and that's definitely the future. But we don't really understand that well why people are and aren't resistant. And here's just an example with PDL1, which is the, of course, the marker for the classic immunotherapy. And you can see that if this whole ball is the tumor in that little section, that's a few hundred slides, they don't all have the same staining pattern. And that heterogeneity is true for not just PDL1, but all of the 20,000 proteins in the proteome and many other things. So that is a big problem. And all it takes is a very small percentage of them to be resistant to standard therapy. And then they've grown out over time. So if you think about it in, in evolutionary terms, you know, you, you basically get rid of almost all of them and then a new clone comes out and that's where the problem arises. So how do we do about it? What do we do about it? So one of the things um, that, that a lot of people in this field are thinking about now is micrometastasis, which is, um, not only can we get the local cancer, but can we do a better job up front of removing the micrometastases? These are the small little bits that are throughout the body that we can't see, that we can't detect by any method that we have now. So this is a slide from my colleague, Yelena um, Jangjigian, um, who's the head of GI cancers at Sloan Kettering. Uh, this is a pretty common thought now, which is that depending on which way we do the surgery and which way we do the therapy, we may be able to get more immune cells into the tumor, and we may be able to remove the number of micromets at the same time. And that's the goal, and that's kind of been the goal for a number of years since we've had immunotherapy, is to remove the, reduce the number of tumors and train the immune system to more and more go into the tumor. So I'm hopeful that, that between these better therapies, as we start to understand them, we can get there. So just kind of a little bit more on this. So, you know, it takes a billion cells to see it on an x-ray. That's a half a centimeter to one centimeter lesion. On a CT scan, you can see a little nodule. That's, 100, that's 10 million. Now, with ctDNA, in the best situation, you can see 10 to the fifth cancer cells. But at least at mass gen, only about 40 to 50% of our stage three patients are even positive to start. So that biomarker test that John just showed that looks really great, you filtered out two-thirds of the people before you even opened the door, right? So what do we do for those other two-thirds of the people? Well, we make the biomarker tests better, and that's some of what I'm, I'm working on. And then this is my colleague, John. Uh, Jeremy does very similar procedures. John Mullen is a uh, surgeon at, at Harvard, he uh, at MassGen. And, you know, with a good endoscopy and really know what you're doing, you can see a few thousand cancer cells, and they can cut it out. But we're still... You, you can't put an endoscope in other parts of the body other than into the stomach or into the GI tract. So we have a lot of work to do and early detection and better detection of minimal residual disease are things we're thinking about. So what is MRD or minimal residual disease? I think you guys all know this, but just to, to define how, how we think about it, it's the presence of cancer after therapy that's intended to be cured without being able to see it on a scan, right? And that's the idea that there is molecular detectable or otherwise detectable disease that is in the body in bunches of little tiny seeds um, that we can't find yet. And below the detectable by imaging, now by ctDNA, we're detecting some of this minimal residual disease. Then there are some patients who have it that we're not detecting, and then we hope we can cure some people. The idea is, in the standard way, as the tumor burden goes down and people are not detected, there's a window in which we might be able to detect them again and do something where instead of getting to a spot where you might be able to be cured and then getting sick again and ending up incurable, we might be able to do another intervention and drop you down into the cured bucket or at least keep you in the not detectable region for longer. So you can see that again here. If we do this more and more surveillance and we have a better and better way to test for it, could we find ways to do better and better therapies to keep people healthy longer? So. This is Sam's um, slide on kind of another way of thinking about that, which is most of our therapy, we just give everybody the same thing, right? We throw everybody in, in platinum, like John said. Um, that's a sort of a standard approach, and it's very common, and it's a good approach. Um, you know, we do the first chemo. It stops working. Okay, then what? Well, now we have to decide what to do again. So we try something else. Now it stopped working again. And I just heard from a number of people that that's where we are. 
right? And that's where people in this room are sitting. So how do you decide, what do you do? Well, what if we could do a better therapy up front and we hold our chemo options until later? Or what if we could better pick who goes on which therapy with the hope is that we could push it out for further as we've got better and better targeted therapies. So, so that's the part I've never talked about before. So hopefully that was not a total waste of everybody's time. Um, so I'm just gonna talk, I have four minutes and then I'll talk a little bit more tonight about what I do. So, well, that way it came out great. Um, <laughs> so um, the transposon that I work on called line one is a virus-like sequence that makes up it's written about a third of the human genome. We have hundreds of thousands of copies of this thing that looks a lot like HIV virus sitting in our genome. And of those hundreds of thousands of copies, everybody has about 100 that are active. And all it wants to do is copy and paste itself to a new place. It's like a computer virus that just wants to make a new copy in a new place. And in trying to do that, we think it causes a lot of problems. But one of the things that's really interesting is that our body, because we've been evolving with this for so long, it keeps it off. And so it's not on in normal tissue. And one of the things we've discovered over the last 10 years, and as we do more and more studies, we're finding that actually a lot of our initial calls were underestimates. Most cancers, especially solid tumors, are positive for this and the corresponding normal organs are not. And so um, in, in our most recent work, we did about 200 colon cancers and about 60 gastroesophageal cancers. And the positivity rate was between 90 and 100% for both. And what's really unique about this is that the normal tissue shown here the colon is negative and the cancer is positive. And here you can see, as I showed kind of before in an earlier stage lesion, in the, in the stomach, both the intestinal type and the diffuse types are positive and the normal glands, which are these blue kind of circles here, are negative. So this presents some, some unique opportunities because it's potentially binary. So what are we doing with this? Well, the first thing we did is we made a blood test, um, which um, required some fancy technology that I don't have time to go into today, but it, it seems to work in a pilot cohort. And what we did is we had a, a group of 19 patients at Mass General where we had blood before they were on therapy. And then we had blood on their therapy as soon as 30 days or out to 120 days. And it was a heterogeneous group. It was just what we had that we had in the freezer. And what we saw was really surprising. I actually had to go back and make sure I hadn't done something wrong because the p-value for this was actually zero, which is that all of the patients who had a response to the therapy had the blood value of this transposon protein fall to zero, whereas all five patients who didn't respond either had an increase or we could still detect it in the blood. And so you could see, here's a patient who responded really nicely, had a big mass here, went down, this is food, and this is the dye in the stomach, and you can see it really on the PET-CT scan, um, whereas one of the patients who increased, we could see growing in their liver lesions. So we're really excited about this, that we might be able to use this to live monitor what's happening to a patient. Um, the tests um, cost us anyway in reagents less than 10 or $20, so we think we could run them a lot, and they use a very small amount of blood. And one of the things we also noticed here is that the patients who didn't respond had higher levels before treatment, um, and when we actually ran this over large cohorts, what we found is that the patients who were low for this marker did better than the patients who were high. And now this looks a lot like a circulating tumor DNA plot, so we don't know whether we're measuring the, D, the, the tumor burden or something about the biology of the cancer or both, but we're working on it. And we're interested to use this going forward to help risk stratify people. And so um, I'm running out of time here, but I think this will end up well because I'm on my last two slides. Um, a trial was done by my colleague Sam Klempner at Mass General. It's now fully enrolled, um, where it's a modified uh, Fulfirinox trial called Nalirafox. Um, that was designed to the sample very extensively so that not only did patients get the best standard of care, um, and, and actually the trial has gone very well, we actually got lots and lots of blood and tissue samples throughout so that we could study what happens to people throughout chemotherapy to try to understand resistance. So that's ongoing, and we have a lot of, of, um, we have a lot of samples, so there's a lot to study in the lab going forward. Um, and so kind of just to wrap up, cancers are old, heterogeneous, and complicated. And so finding them early and preventing them is the best route to a cure. Um, but, uh, but as we heard earlier, that doesn't help you now if you're already stage four. So um, I think that as John was saying, a lot of these revolutions in technology, we have better and better tools and better and better molecular understanding. New therapies are coming down the pipe that are going to work better and we're going to be able to make improvements. Um, so I just wanna thank everybody again for the stories and for participating in the trials. It makes the biggest difference and it's great for me to hear um, 
You know, I miss this part of the, as a pathologist, I miss the communication with patients. And, and I really am just inspired by, by the strength of everybody to, 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 to push through this and to work through this and to keep fighting. And it helps us to learn how to provide better care. So we're really grateful. So anybody who wants to know our team, we have a great team at, Sloan, at uh, both Sloan Kettering and Collaboration and at MassGen um, who are running trials. And Jeremy Davis, he'll talk in a little bit at the NIH. And then uh, the transposon stuff, I'm going to talk a little bit more about tonight. And I'll just say for now that we think in the future, this is going to be very useful as a biomarker. We think that we can do better than circulating tumor DNA markers because of the uniqueness of this. Um, and then in the future, we have some ideas for how we can use this idea that the transposons are in cancer and they're not a normal to make a new kind of drug that nobody has thought about before that might kill the cancer. So that's what my lab is doing going forward. Doesn't help anybody right now, but hopefully in the next five to 10 years, some of these things work and we can get them out. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Oh, and then I forgot the most important slide, um, which is a, a big thanks to the team, especially Aki for having me here and, and a huge team of people, both from funding and in the lab who've made this happen.